This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. My guest today found herself a single mom when her husband left her after many years of marriage. Peggy Sue Wells went on to raise her family and began writing books to encourage other single moms. She shares her story with me today. The 10 best decisions. How do you arrive at, first of all, there's only 10. There's only 10. <laughs> yeah, and actually that was a spinoff with my co-author, Pam mm -hmm. Farrell, because Bill and Pam Farrell have written a lot of the 10 best decisions for parents. And, okay. Yeah, singles, and I'm mm -hmm. like, what about single moms? Yeah. And so we put it together. But you've got things like decide to thrive, decide to be decisive create a nurturing, nurturing home, and we can't go through all of it, but I've got a couple questions here about on, on that, that uh, chapter right there. Uh, you're talking about emotions and the relationship glue. If we stifle our emotions, if we shut them down, that, that it's okay to be angry. We're talking about people that have been through a whole lot as single moms, and that you're giving them, uh, I guess, the, uh, the permission to, to experience their emotions. And God said, be angry and sin not. Anger mm -hmm. is not a bad thing. It's actually God's gift of extra adrenaline that we use then to right a wrong. Yeah. And so it's a good thing. And we get used to stuffing our emotions and that's not healthy either. But what happens with single moms and their kids is when you have that serious core relationship that blows apart, the moms and the kids go into trauma. And so we have trauma brain and so the thinking part of our brain goes offline and we go back into fight, flight, freeze, or please. And that's mm -hmm. what we're operating out of. And so sometimes we'll look at single moms and we're like, what is she thinking? And we'll look at her kids and we're like, what are they thinking? And they're not. It's physically impossible they're because they're, they're, they're reacting. Because if you're like running from a bear or if you've got a fire, you want to react. And so we're back in trauma brain and trauma brain causes those type of odd reactions. Mm -hmm. And kids wind up down at the principal's office more often, and so that's the myth of mo single moms are not good moms. But what's actually happening is the kids are in trauma, and that's mm -hmm. how it comes out. And so if they're with principals and teachers that understand bad behavior is not bad kids, it's bad behavior is broken hearts, then we can start yeah. making some progress. And if you look at the stats, 50%, of kids. The, cool. Yeah, raising in a, in a single parent fa yeah. family. And you look at those stats and it's the same thing inside the church and outside the church. Uh, there's a lot of self-help books written. What gave you the, the I guess, the, the energy to do this and the, the background to do this? And at the same time, why is this one special? For a lot of the church and faith-based groups, we have kind of not known what to do with single moms and their mm -hmm. families, and so we kind of haven't addressed it. So being able to put this book together, I think was a big step forward because we really haven't known how to handle that. Um, my background for it is I'm the mom of seven children. Mm -hmm. And when the baby was- said that in the, in, in the <laughs> intro, but I didn't want to give that away. Seven, seven. kids, seven. yeah. Nobody will believe that as they yeah. see you on television. <laughs> and with those seven, the baby was a year old when their dad chose out. And so that gave me her entire lifetime to you know be a single mom. And so when I get to the end of it, I had some people say, you gotta write a book. And I'm like, I don't wanna necessarily be that single mom person, you know, that identity. And they said, well, you've done it a long time. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, like two decades. And they said, have you learned a few things? Do you know what works? I'm like, I know a ton of stuff that doesn't work. And I know a lot of good stuff that does work. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to put the tips that work into this book. I'm going to put all the good stuff, all the things that will help you be successful into this book. There's nothing about, no negatives in there. It's just all the how to move forward. I don't want to get too personal on that, but uh, the kids still have a relationship. I mean, you have seven kids. Mm -hmm. One of them was a, was a baby. Mm -hmm. The dad left then. Mm -hmm. How's the relationship with those younger those younger children? With their with, with their father. With their father. Now that they're all adults, they are going to navigate that, and mm -hmm. it's not easy. But you have a you broken them, heart. How did you help them navigate that through the time when they were six or seven or, or ten years yeah. old? And that's you know that's a fascinating question because helping them navigate with their broken hearts, and then also trying to keep a bridge with someone who mm -hmm. isn't part of the household, it gets very complicated, and depending on the household and depending on the situation, 
it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's a, it's, it's a lot easier to, you know, have a rough year and then they kind of slide into a new normal. And then there's other people where it stays very rocky yeah. for a very long time. And so that trauma brain that the mom and the kids are going through continues to happen over and over. Every phone call, every holiday, yeah. every time we have to go to court, every time somebody ages out and so then there's another court situation. You may have to move, you may have to go get a different job, the finances change. So it's just a constant trauma. It's a constant heartache mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. needing to work through that. Well, one of the things you mentioned, and it, I think it's in uh, one of your practical to-do things, is to journal with your children. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, at what point did you pick that up where you're going to journal with the kids and, and tell us about that? Because yeah. it, it may help them express a lot of that underlying trauma. Because I have the seven, it's easy for me to look at how each child is wired differently. Mm -hmm. And so I have some extroverts like their mom, and then I have some very deep introverts. And then I have some kids that is like, it was hard for them to voice what they were feeling, sure. but they could write it. So I'm not sure where the idea came from, but I did get a blank book and I just wrote in the front of it and I said, this is for you and I to write back and forth in. Whatever you want to say, you can say it. Um, and I will not be checking for grammar or spelling <laughs> or handwriting. That's all, you know, that's, this is all, all skate. You know, you get a get out of jail free card on that. And so I would write something to them set it next to their bed. And sometimes I would get that book back and forth and every day we would write back and forth. Occasionally it would just sit for a while. They didn't have anything to say. And so then it would become dusty and then maybe somebody would then rewrite in it again. But I would get questions like, you know, why doesn't my dad love me? And what should we do for Christmas gifts this year? And how are we gonna handle this holiday coming up? And so it was a lot easier for some of the kids to, to write it than to be able to talk it. When you're, when you're talking about that and, and the, uh, the children being able to trust you now, you're the leader of the family. How do you, how do you give them that confidence that uh, there's, there's no male in the house? There's no alpha male, mm -hmm. but you're, you're, and you're not playing both roles. You're the mom. Yeah. Right. Uh, you can't be the alpha male, but you can be the mom. How do you give them that, that trust? Because you deal with that, uh, it's still in the nurturing home chapter, but on page 66, where you talk about all the things you can do to give your child confidence that it's not the same, but it's going to be all right. Yeah, and I think one thing that's very important is for moms not to try to be mom and dad because they have a dad. They still have a dad. Yeah. He's responsible for his own role with them. And, you know, some of us are great parents and some of us could use a lot of help. Um, but the things that I thought were helpful for my children was, number one, to be as consistent as possible within our home. Because when you have kids that are bouncing from one place to another, there's different rules in different places. And they sort of have this issue where there's a, a pressure to almost create an attachment disorder because the weekend that you're with mom, you have these, you know, soccer yeah. practice and you have your toothbrush and you have your bedroom and you have these rules and these friends. And then when you go to another parent's house, you have a different toothbrush and the clothes that are there sometimes can't come back and the toys that are there can't come back. And so you have these kids that are having to say, I mean, they're doing what adults won't do, you know, doing this go back and forth thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for them to learn how to have a relationship when they're having to, you know, just break off every week and do yeah. something different. And so I'm not saying that I have an answer for that. I'm just saying it's a hard, it's a very hard situation for our kids. And I'm not sure that it's creating a healthy one. Um, but so that's why when I, when they were back home, the more consistent I could be, the better off for them so that they knew, okay, when we come here, this is how it always is. I can relax. Um, I also made sure that I wanted to introduce them to Jesus as soon as possible. And the reason for that is, even when I was sitting with my mentor one time, and I'm just crying like crazy and snotting and using up all of her Kleenex, and she said, what are you afraid of? And I'm like, I'm afraid I can't love them enough. I can't give uh -huh. them enough. Yeah. And she said, you can't. And I was like, oh, I knew it was terrible. And she said, no, no, no. She said, whether you're a single parent or whether you're dual parenting, you can't give them enough love because all of us have that place that we can only have filled by God and by God's love. So the fastest thing that I could do is to 
introduce them to Jesus as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And so we did Bible time every night. And so we would read a chapter and then I would pray over the children. And then pretty soon as they could, they would pray out loud and we prayed youngest to oldest. And then we would start memorizing scripture and then we just, you know, kind of built it. And so in the back of the book, there's actually an appendix of the Bible mm -hmm. time that we did. And you can pick and pull from that if it helps you get started. But the important thing, family Bible time is reading scripture and prayer. And then I would pray, pray blessings over them, which they loved. So the thing is just, can I give them that foundation? Because this is all about eternity. This is your source. Your source is not dad, mm -hmm. it's not mom. It's actually God. So as soon as I could get them in that direction, that's where I wanted to point them. But did you overtly understand that, that you're gonna set this tone in your house, this, this emotional tone and this spiritual tone? Or is it so chaotic that you just finally resolve yourself to that, that they're going to be, like you say, you've got some introverts, you've got some yeah. extroverts, but you've got to set the emotional tone in the home. You've got to yes. do that, right? Yeah. In fact, pretty much every mom does. Whatever mm -hmm. your situation is, pretty much mom sets the tone of the home. I'm not saying it's easy, mm -hmm. but it's kind of the truth. And so we get to choose what kind of home we want to raise our children in. And so for a lot of times when there is a divorce or separation, a lot of times there was a boundary that was put down because we're making a decision about what kind of home we want to yeah. raise our children in. And so the consistency was really important. Having, we had like four or five just rules. These were the rules. You don't call somebody a name. You don't hit, you don't take something that's not yours because your things are your things. Mm -hmm. And so if a sibling wants, they have to get permission. And if they break it, they have to fix it or they have to replace it. And then there was also no deliberately disobeying mom and no lying. So yeah. those were the household rules. That was it. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of like all, you know, knew that that was where we were going to do as our foundation. And I remember one time I was in the morning, I was getting dressed and my kids were, I could hear some scrapping going on downstairs. And so I come to the top of the stairs. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And the, the baby, she's like four or five at the time, comes running over and she's standing at the bottom of the stairs and she looks up at me and she goes, Josiah called me a name. And I'm like, that's odd, you know, he doesn't normally do that. And I said, okay, what did he call you? He called me opinionated. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not a name, that's the truth. <laughs> that's, so, yeah, that's so character. we had to do a lot of laughter. We had to have a lot of opportunity where, you know, you got your homework done, but you also had time to play and you had time to just relax. And you had time to read and you had time to be with your animals and you had time to play music. And, you know, what did we need to do to make the home peaceful? And then what could I do that would help the children know in this place, you're going to have this the home is an art studio for us. So you can explore, you can learn how to have relationships. We can talk about things and you can test things out, but this is your place and that you'll be safe here. And you, you've got, I mean, with seven, you had six in the home, right? With, with when your husband, all left? seven, you had seven. Yeah. At the time. yeah. Uh, how old was the oldest? She was just starting work. She She's, just had, was okay. 18. Yeah. So you've got some in the teens mm -hmm. and you're trying to set this tone and you're setting the, the emotional tone for the home and you've got the rules. They're all different. Yes. And they, they're, they're coming to those rules from the different locations and they're yes. coming from those, those rules with a different mindset and at different ages. How do you, how do you bring all that together? I mean, you can't sit down a, a one-year-old and a, and a 16-year-old and give them those same rules and just explain it the same way. How do you translate that and what do you do when the rules are broken with a one-year-old or a 16-year-old? How do you yeah. balance all of that? The rules stayed the same no matter. Mm -hmm. The lying, how we treated one another, those things stayed the same regardless. There's consistency there. It was, yeah, because that's how you show respect to another human. And so we needed to learn that at home so then we could go out and do that elsewhere. And as far as, you know, like teaching it to one kid over another, because they have different personalities, sure. then... You know, with somebody, it needed to be a little bit stronger. And then with somebody else, it was a look across the room and they were like, I got it. So mm -hmm. it's finding out the different personalities of the kids. I had a couple of kids that if they were kind of clingy, they were fine. Mm -hmm. If they weren't clingy, I had to look into it. I had other kids that if they were clingy, there was a problem. Was a problem. And, you know, if they were off doing their thing, everything was great. Mm -hmm. That's parenting 101. You know, you did that with your kids. That's what we all do with our kids is just... How has God knit this person together? And it's not so much training as it's discovering who this person is and then allowing them to move forward into their full potential, into their calling and their anointing by the Holy Spirit into what God's already prepared for them to do. 
You can find Peggy Sue's book on Amazon and Christian online bookstores. After the break. Everybody got laid off. Well, in the process of me getting laid off, uh, I got hired as a part-time chaplain, the Marketplace Chaplain. It's a come alongside ministry, so we go right into the organization and come alongside people. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Lacey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today I want to introduce you to a couple who get to go inside the workplace to help encourage employees with a message of hope in a culture where employers might often try to keep Christ out. This couple has found a way to bring him back in, all with permission of the business owners. My guest is Veronica and Aaron McLaurin. When, I, when we first met, you were kind of involved in that, this ministry we we're going to talk about because we went to a luncheon together and you guys had just come in off of a factory floor. <laughs> it's the Marketplace Chaplaincy. Okay, so the Marketplace Chaplaincy came about, I was working at my job of something like 10, 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, got laid off because of a back injury and it was just that season to where the economy had took a turn and mm -hmm. uh, everybody got laid off. Well, in the process of me getting laid off, uh, I got hired as a part-time chaplain mm -hmm. to Marketplace Chaplains. And it was then, you know, that I began to uh, really get into the Word a little bit more and began to go outside the church walls mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and into the uh, uh, marketplace and began to minister to that, which is a wonderful thing. Isn't it amazing how when, <laughs> when God does call you to something like that, it drives you to the Word? You say, I, 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 I wanted does. to get deeper in the Word because yes. people are starting to ask you questions and people are starting to find, you know, yes. really get serious about your walk with Christ. How did He call you into the same? I mean, because yeah. that was fine for Aaron, but you busy, you had a job, you, yeah. you were ordained minister as well. Absolutely. About six years after Aaron, mm -hmm. um, economy was still taking a bad turn. And there needed to be some cuts and we you know i just said Let, let's do it it's here and so um i walked into the same thing i think it was no more than six months i knew god was calling mm -hmm. me into the ministry of the marketplace as well An opportunity came up and i prayed about it and i went for it wow so T tell me about the ministry itself marketplace chaplaincy because i you know i've been in, involved in christian ministries for quite a while i won't tell you how long <laughs> but uh had never heard of. of course there's a lot of them you never hear of but uh, i've never heard of it tell me about it it's a wonderful ministry uh and the way it kind of works is we go into the marketplace mm -hmm. or into the company uh once a week uh and we walk through the entire plant and we hold small short conversations with people throughout the day and we mm -hmm. ask them how their day is going and mm -hmm. this and that and we don't expect or suspect uh, that they'll reach out and say hey this is going on but over time we build a trust we, we, we build yeah. a trust with the people with the company and organization mm -hmm. and we might come over and we might visit a person they may be fine those two or three weeks but that one week, uh, they may have lost a loved mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that loved one may have been lost. They may have lost a loved one two cities over. Like, you know, we oh, yeah. here in Lima, and they may have lost somebody in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Well, they can share that with us because, you know, you know, the, the, manage, the management has already shared, this person has lost somebody. Uh, could you go over there and check up on them? We hold that conversation. They got their mindset on what has happened in Cleveland. Well, I could pray with that person right here in town, and then I could make a phone call, and within an hour or so, somebody in the Cleveland area, another chaplain, can go and visit that person at the hospital. Now, that struggle of that loved ones alone is, all, is by themselves. Mm -hmm. They now got God, and and it, and it just it's does a great it, connection. It's so a great the connection. Is, the network is there. Yeah, the absolutely. Awesome. So it's a national national ministry. National ministry. It's a come alongside ministry. So we go right into the organization and come alongside people right where they are. The women, the men, 
um, they try to have a male and female chaplain at each site or organization. Mm -hmm. And you just come right alongside them. Most of the employees are just like, I can't believe I can <laughs> just have somebody yeah. to talk to while I'm working. They love it. How did it feel walking out on the factory floor that first time? Well, I tell you, it was a little intimidating because you're walking through spaces where they're slicing pork and they're, you know, creating melting uh, plastic tubes. And so you're, you, you actually dress like them. So you put on the smock and you go in as a person, you come right where they are. And God makes it really easy to talk because they don't find you threatening. You're not in your, you know, your suit and tie. Mm -hmm. You just come right where they are. And um, one of the things that you don't do is you, you don't just start, Jesus Christ loves you and you need to know him. And uh, you don't slap him over the head with the Bible. Yeah. Um, you just come right where they are and you ask, how's your day? How are things going? What kind of response do you get from the employers? <laughs> from the, the well, they say maybe the employers all for it, but the production manager or somebody mm -hmm. like that who's, mm -hmm. you may be interrupting a little bit of his production that day. What, what kind of responses you're getting? Well, um, it all depends on the day. Some days uh, it's hurry up and get that product out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other days it may be hurry up and get that product out, but I'm so glad you came because yeah. the morale, the uh -huh. tension, mm -hmm. life just overtaken. And it's, you know, when, when you go talk about organizations and companies, you're talking about groups of people, cliques and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so what one person affect, it may affect maybe four or five different people. Yeah. And so we have that, you know, those four or five different people that it has affected, the manager may not have very much control over that person or group. And so when we come in, we can stir that whole atmosphere into a positive thing. And so there's some times we come in and they say, just do what you do. Other yeah. times we have to get the product out. So it all depends on yeah. the day, but we've, we've, we certainly have those moments mm -hmm. and we enjoy them. So we're, we're, the town that you're in, you're, you're into what, three or four different plants? Three or four different ones right now. Correct, yeah. yes. And an insurance company as well. Yeah. Yes. So how do, you, how do you make that, do you have to make that contact with the manufacturer, with the marketplace? Do you, I mean, is that part of your, your responsibility? Well, actually we have a uh, supervisor and they're, they're kind of like the EDO, they're, they're the director of a certain region mm -hmm. and they contact companies. They're constantly um, marketing to try to get more companies to join. Mm -hmm. And then they just assign us as chaplains to those companies. What are the kind of mistakes that somebody might be able to might might make if they're over enthusiastic when they walk on that floor? Trying to um, get in front of God, trying to um, um, beat the person over the head with the Bible. Yeah. Uh, Jesus this or God that. Trying and to be God for them or that's absolutely, right. uh, that's the worst mistake that you can make because most of the time people they want to do a good job. Because obviously they, they're at work, uh, and then they also um, they would love to share. Because mm -hmm. with people, that's just part of our nature. We want to share certain things and how things are going, sure. whether it's good, bad, or ugly. It's it's not until you know when you open up that line of communication, how's your day going, and begin to talk directly to them and not about something that they may know about or that they may not know about. It's not until when you come to them yeah. and say. How are you doing? And, and hold that nice conversation with them. And they begin to pour out and share because what happens is you're building the trust, mm -hmm. you're building the relationships, you're building the confidence. Everything that you know as a person, you're starting to build because they see you on a day, daily basis. Mm -hmm. They see you on a consistent time. You know, he's here every day at this time. He's asking the same. He must yeah. really like me. He must really like his job. Let me share. And if there is a God, let me see what God can do something like this here. Now, the way they think and the way they put things together, people are mine is just totally whack sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we just, we yeah. got our own way of thinking. Yes. And sometimes we got to bring it back to the biblical, yeah. you know, I, I'm, most of the time I'm saying, you know, it's fine for you to think that way, mm -hmm. but this is how the word of God says it. And I explained hear what they have to say and then I explain the word of God and then we just meet somewhere in the middle yeah, I and I believe that meeting in the middle is the Holy Spirit saying now this is how I'm going to bring this together and this is how I'm going to get the glory and now 
that experience of the Holy Ghost, the spirit, you know, the, the spirit of what you was talking about. It's like, I'm so glad I talked to them. Yeah. I'm so now yeah. they're looking for a relationship sure. on their own with God because they just well, had that experience. Yeah. You mentioned relationship and that's how that's how Jesus was in I mean, that's how he would, would come to people in a, in a relationship attitude. He'd Absolutely. Break bread with them or Absolutely. Or, there are there relationships that, that really continued on that you that you can look back on and say now that that relationship has developed, that person really has grown closer to Christ. Oh yes, um, there are times when you speak with individuals on the floor and you can see the anxiousness on them. There's so many young people struggling mm -hmm. with anxiety and being in the workplace and trying to work. Um, there's one individual that I was able to continue to connect with and you see them now getting yeah. stronger at work and they're Pretty confident. Sure. It's just a blessing. Yeah. It's a blessing. It is. It's and it's all about the relationship. That's Absolutely. Right. A lot of times they want things to happen just yeah. like that. And the blessing in that is that you get to explain and share with them nothing just happens just like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's gonna be a day to day process mm -hmm. and it's gonna it, the relationship is that you gotta get up and you got to ask God to help you to get help through each it. day. Mm -hmm. And the things that you feel like there's a void or that you're missing, you're gonna to ask God for those. Because that's how you build relationships. Sure. That's mm -hmm. how you actually walk, you know, in relationship mm -hmm. with God. And so when 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 I look back over some of the stories that yeah. you know people was going through, I'm talking about the loss of a loved one mm -hmm. or uh a divorce or they didn't think they was going to make it to the job sure. because of whatever reason. And then two or three years later, you know, we come in and they say, you know, I remember when I was going through this here, <laughs> like, yeah, God is good, man. You know, it's the, their relationship has grown, yours has grown. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's just phenomenal how God works. Yes. Do you ever get people asking you about, about the company, something that's more business oriented or they want some insider information? I mean, how do you deal with that? Is that some kind of, a place where you could get really tripped up if you're not careful? You can, if you're not careful. Um, just had a challenge like that this past week. Yeah. Um, but again, you just bring them back to this is this is about you, and we're here to talk about ways to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you bring it right back to the individual and what God wants to do in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also get so excited about the things of God. Sure. To where, you know, you can you you want to you want to pull it back because if you don't it's like um it's like say for instance you're dealing with a loss of a loved one or a sick parent or a sick whatever and it's like oh god's not gonna let that happen you know you can't get a, you know in front of it you know mm -hmm. what god's gonna do but at the, end, at the end of the day you can be so excited and so full of what god has done in your life uh you could probably give out the wrong information you so project it on them yeah Absolutely. yeah you want to project your faith. Oh, I will just believe God's going to do this. You just want them to be, you know, right, right. where they're at That's and right. just kind of build them. So, yes, you can, you know, sometimes get overexcited. But at the end of the day, you know, that's just one of those beginning mistakes that you have to work through when it sure. just allow the spirit to teach you. <laughs> to find out more about the workplace ministry of Veronica and Aaron, look up our show notes on the YouTube page or the website below. Viewpoint is made possible by the support of viewers just like you. Make sure you follow us on YouTube and share these shows with your friends. Thanks for joining me. I'm Bob Placey.